There's so much that we love about Only Fools and Horses, but the beating heart of the show is undoubtedly the relationship between the Trotter brothers. Without the relationship between, um, you know, Rodney and Del Boy, there would be no Only Fools and Horses. They complemented each other beautifully. Oh, oh, hello, Tallyo, Sir Herbert. Did you Ken John Peel? Mm. Come on, boy. Just take Kick a it. look at him, will you? He spent three hours in a stately home and he thinks he's the Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> you can't wait to get a shotgun and a retriever and go marching across the grouse moors all done up like a ploughman's lunch, can you? I don't think of Dill and Rodney as characters on a sitcom. I actually think of them as real people. And that is an amazing testament to the acting skills of both of them. Del Boy, for all his bluff and bluster, you know, he looks after his granddad and he brings up his orphan's kid brother. There's a real warmth and heart to it that I think people clocked quite early on without having it rammed down your throat. And the fact that they were getting to grips with some real hardships, but not in a mawkish way. Nothing ever upsets Del Boy. I've always played the tough guy. I didn't want to, but I had to. And I've played it for so long now, I don't know how to be anything else. I don't even know how to... Oh, it don't matter. Bloody families, I've finished with them. What do they do to you, eh? Hold your back, drag you down, and then they break your bloody heart. You get to see his feelings and what's going on behind the Del Boy mask, but he's just putting on this show for everyone. That's what makes you love the characters. As is so often the case with great comic characters, Del Boy was based on personal experience. I know a large chunk of Only Falls and Horses were based on John Sullivan's own experiences. Uh, he was a market trader. When you've actually been to a market and there's someone pitching the gear, you know, they are fascinating people to begin with, you know, at work. To see how they deal with life on life's terms as well, that's a brilliant bit of insight from Sullivan. Here's one of many examples of writing and performance combining to make market trading Dell so authentic. Now, just look what I bought you today, girls. Look at that. Authentic French nylon tights, all right? As worn by Sasha Distel's mum. No, seriously, I'm being serious. Now, they're 20 denier and they're sheer nylon. Not only are they run-proof, but they're fun-proof as well. When he's on the screen, you don't take your eyes off of him because he's making you feel the character. You kind of become him, and you might take a bit of that mannerism the next day out with you, like, oh, Cushy. Delboy wasn't made up out of thin air. It was taken from characters that he'd met over the past. There was a guy who um, I used to work for when I was an electrician, I was a subcontractor. I can never forget him because he used to do that all the time. <laughs> and he had, the, he had the gold bracelets, the rings and everything. And he used to do that. All right? All right, my son. And he did leave a tremendous impression on me. And when this character came up, I just kept thinking about him. But it wasn't just the performance and the dialogue that made these characters feel authentic. They had to look the part too. These are the original costume design sketches, rarely seen on TV. Now, I did sketches for the main characters with a sort of key kind of look. I think that Rodney and the grandfather are probably fairly close to those sketches. It was Dell who was really, I think, developed into something slightly different. He's quite paunchy, he's got quite a beer belly on him, and Dave Jason's not like that at all. So I think it was a bit off on his one. Then once um, I sort of got going on it, I took Dave Jason out shopping for his lovely wardrobe up the sort of duff end of Oxford Street <laughs> and we had quite a fun time. Very amenable, tried on all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Terrible suits and the sheepskin. He used to like sort of, you know, jigging about in it. He did look great in that thing. I mean, that is very market trader, that. It's quite a common look, that. It's well observed. Some of the shots, the early shots of the market was in Chapel Street Market in Islington. That was the market that I grew up in. And I know for a fact that that is where the dresser went down to buy fake gold wristbands and watches right. that he wore on the show. That's what I'm saying, but their research the was amazing. They had it spot yeah. on.
Appearance was a major theme throughout, with Dell's obsession with image perfectly holding a mirror up to 80s yuppie culture. Are you saying I've got to get an image? No, what I'm saying is you've got to get rid of one. <laughs> you see, you take a look at me, you see, I wear a trendy trench coat, Gordon Gecko braces, you wear a lumberjack's coat and Gordon Bennett boots. <laughs> My image says I'm going right to the top flat out. Your image says I'm going back to bed because I'm shagged out. <laughs> Dell encapsulates that, but he never, he never gets there. This time next year, we'll be millionaires. Of course, it, it caught the mood and it summed up Dell completely. Tough at the top, eh, Dell? Yeah, yeah, don't worry, we're going to get to the top one day. Don't worry, this time next year, we will be millionaires. <laughs> it worked really well and it was, it was poking fun in a way, at the achievers and the showing off of the yuppiness of it all, which was all really rather silly now in retrospect. Now that is a bit of me. David took it beautifully and played with it beautifully. <laughs> Del Boy is aspiring to be better than what he is, you know, and he's looking at these kind of high-end people, particularly kind of the yuppie scene, but then he just kind of kills himself when he has all these misuses of French phrases. Yes. Well, goodbye. Hey. No, no, not goodbye, Margaret. No, just bonjour. <laughs> Au revoir when he says hello and bonjour when he says goodbye. One of my favourite things with that yuppie type of thing was when Del Boy was drinking cocktails all the time. Del's cocktails are legendary, aren't they? Come on, Michael, give us a drink, will you? Lager top for Rodney and I'll have uh, a Baileys and Cherryade. <laughs> <laughs> what it does is signify that, that aspirational thing and he's getting it wrong, you know. Nobody who lives the high life, you know, really drinks cocktails like Del. It's just him trying to work his way up the ladder. Look, I drink these, you know. He who wants to seem worldly wise and sophisticated, of course, he's none of those things. I constantly use the word Del Boy. I will say, so-and-so is a bit of a Del Boy. Everybody understands what you mean by that. If somebody's a bit of a ducker and diver, you know, it can't be totally trusted, but quite likeable. And I kind of grew up in a bit of a Del Boy house. We'd have random things and you'd say to me, Dad, where's that from? Oh, that, you know, I've just bought a few. And you look around, there's like 50 of them in the back garden. So, Your dad uh... was Del Boy. <laughs> I don't know just one Del Boy. I've come across loads. And I've actually invested in a few as well. I'm not sure they were my best successes in fairness. And now and again, you come across somebody and you think, he deserves a chance. That guy is an absolute trier. And just with some guidance, who knows? He could be a millionaire. Rodney, on the other hand, I think would have been happy just to have a bit of a steady job and a settled home life. What I like about Rodney is there's a kind of secret intelligence to him. You know, he's kind of quite bright underneath all that, but he never gets the airtime to him to articulate himself. This is a constant source of conflict, conveyed brilliantly here by both actors. I am 24 years old. I have two GCEs, 13 years of schooling, and three terms at an adult education centre behind me, right? And with all that, what have I become? I'm a lookout. <laughs> no, Rodney, you're wrong. You're not just a lookout. You're a bad lookout! <laughs> All right, so I'm not very good at it. Perhaps that's because my art's not really in it. I'm not asking you to put your art in it, just your eyes will do. <laughs> so there's something so brilliant about Rodders, who's actually in many ways far more sensible, in some ways far more, far more adept as a human being. He is the reasonable, sensible viewers going, don't do this, Del, don't do this. You know this is going to fail, you know. But yet again, he's sort of, he's tricked into going along with Del's Oh, brain plans, usually. Well, it'll be a doddle. This stream's jam-packed with salmon. We just put our rocks in and whip them out. Del, it is illegal, it is immoral, it is unethical. All right. Me and Grandad will go on our own and split the profits between us. No, I didn't say I wouldn't come, did I? <laughs> but despite well, the constant and hilarious straight. bickering... You give my arse an headache, Rodney. <laughs> and Dell regularly humiliating his brother. Just look at me. I'm supposed to be going out in this tonight. Well, you've ruined it, haven't you? 
poor Rodney, so tall, and he's always got his shoulders stooped, and his face looks long, mm. and it, and you can really feel Rodney's disappointment all the time and unfairness of what Abdel boys asked him to do. Thanks to you, I am now a 26-year-old man who's just come second in a skateboard derby. <laughs> I fell off! There was clearly a huge amount of love between them. I told you not to go mad. <laughs> well, their dynamic's fantastic because it's a total love-hate relationship, but they, they'd be lost without each other. They don't have any parents. They really have that love connection more than most brothers, and they kind of only have, have each other to rely on, really. they got it all now, yeah. And this is no more evident than at Rodney's wedding where Dell, in the role of brother, father, best man and business partner, says goodbye to the life they had together. Oh, we had a few good years, eh? <laughs> yeah, we had some good times. Yeah. Right laughs. And a couple of tears. Still, that's what it's all about, isn't it? I just wish that... I just wish Granddad and Mum could... Oh, no, shut up. You have me guy. I think it's Sullivan at his best, and that's saying something. It's kind of heartbreaking when Waters finally gets married, and it's just so beautifully written. And it could quite easily have been heavy-handed, because obviously you're dealing with Del Boy being happy for him, but at the same time, he's, he's suffering a loss, because he's losing this... In a way, he's losing his partner. The moment when he leaves, and obviously he's pleased for him, and you get that feeling, but then when Del Boy reaches and he takes the little figurine of the groom off the cake, which obviously represents Rodney to him. To He's just such a beautifully elegant, really simple, but really sort of almost heartbreaking moment of television. Sullivan had a way of bringing characters to life in a real 3D way. You know, he would give them the tools to not only bring the humor, but to be very human and real with it, and to bring the pathos uh, and the empathy. This is perhaps most strongly felt during a heartbreaking scene in the show's original finale that sees Dell and Rodney trapped in a lift soon after Cassandra suffers a miscarriage. My God, that scene makes me cry every single time. It's so real, it's so raw, it's just perfect. I and Cass were so happy, Del. We were looking forward and all we could see in front of us was this big, wide highway and we were just cruising down it and all of a sudden it came to a shuddering halt. Just like this poxy lift. We had a joint decision that we would not do it in front of an audience. And I put them up against the wall in a lift, so there was nothing clever to shoot. It was shot far more like a drama. What John did was, even when he got quite sentimental or, or there was a, you know, a difficult or moment that they had to deal with, and it never got overly sad for long. He would quickly pull the rug from under that and hit you with a joke so that he didn't, like dissolve into mawkishness and self-pity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> it's the only way I could get you talking. Can't run away in a broken lift. You did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Come here. Wait. Come on. The twist in it, the very end, is absolute moment of just this love that you feel that is there for the two brothers. To be able to have that kind of moment in a sitcom where you just go, how am I laughing one second, crying another second and laughing again? And it's like, whoa. <laughs> I don't think John would ever say that the drama would ever want to take over the comedy. And I do remember on a couple of occasions when we were in the gallery and it was very quiet, there would be everyone to see me, we were doing a very moving scene and he would go, God, nobody seems to be laughing or anything. And I said, you know, John, you know, the pe people are 
completely wrecked. They're almost crying out there, you know. Uh, he, he, he was nervous when there wasn't anybody laughing. Next, we'll reveal what some of Dell's favourite phrases really mean. You plonker. And work out what's going on inside the mind of this Nags Head regular. I think they do think, you know, I am a few sandwiches short of a picnic.